Talking to people can be uncomfortable, it can be awkward, it can be difficult, but it cannot be replaced. In today's episode, I'm joined by Alex Schattenberg from the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition of Canada to talk about the importance and power of human connection. Stay tuned. Hi folks, my name is Cam. I am the host of the Pro-Life Guys podcast, a show dedicated to equipping you with the tools that you need to have compassionate and compelling conversations about abortion so together we can change minds, save lives, and transform our culture. Thanks a ton for tuning in um, and for being a part of the Pro-Life Guys podcast. It's a joy to have you along for the ride. Um, here we are, um, autumn 2023. I got colors changing all around me. Autumn is in the air. Um, without a doubt, my favorite season. And without a doubt, look at this transition. It wasn't even planned. Holy moly. Um, without a doubt, one of my favorite people, Alex Schattenberg, joining the show today. Alex Schattenberg is an excellent friend of mine. Um, just an, an excellent human being. He is so wise. He is so caring. He's so knowledgeable, not only on the, the euthanasia and assisted suicide front. I first met Alex over 10 years ago at a presentation that, that he gave in Lethbridge, Alberta. Um, I've heard him speak dozens of times. And one of the things that I'll get into um, in my conversation with him is how highly he values and understands human connection. I feel like as our, our culture gets more and more digital, as it gets more and more social media oriented, all this kind of thing, there's always this temptation for people who now have an excuse not to have human interactions. Um, I, I don't want to dump too much on billboards. Billboards are important as a, a component of education um, in that they, they mass engage uh, people driving by, that kind of thing, but it doesn't replace human interaction. E even internally, looking at CCBR, looking at projects like our postcarding campaign or, or vehicle choice gene or banner campaigns, absolutely essential, I think, in spreading information in a very highly efficient way, they cannot replace human interaction. I would be incredibly remiss if CCBR or other pro-life organizations ever decided that we're not going to do conversations anymore. We're just dropping off postcards. We're just doing um, driving our trucks around. As I mentioned, very important component, getting people thinking, getting people considering the reality of abortion, giving them the opportunity to call in with the phone number on the back of the postcards, on the side of the truck, that kind of thing. Because that human interaction is so important. I want people to call in. I want people to talk to us at our street corner displays. I want people to talk to us at, at door knocking, even if that includes expressing frustration or disappointment or anger or sadness pertaining to the images that they've seen before. I want them to be prepared for a conversation. But even more importantly, I want them in a conversation because I think that there is simply no replacing the value of human connection. I know that this is something that Peter and I actually way back when touched on with our friend um, south of the border, Mark Harrington, um, president, executive director, head honcho, don't know exactly his title at Created Equal, um, and the power of human interaction as it pertains especially to social media and how social media is a a necessary addition at times because the conversation about abortion is happening on that forum and so we need to be interacting there as well but how important it is to have face-to-face -face live interactions is irreplaceable I think Alex is better than anybody when it comes to talking about the importance of it. And the ministry that he does with the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition of Canada, um, he travels around the world. And not only does he interact with people who are in dire straits, who are themselves considering medical assistance in dying, euthanasia, assisted suicide. He talks with family members, friends, coworkers of people who are considering that and coaches them through how to foster relation, how to foster um, a response to the loneliness or isolation that person might be feeling, but also even in talking with pro-lifers and talking with people who oppose him, how willing he is to rearrange his schedule. Um, as I'm going to get into, I mean, the guy, the guy's a hero when it comes to talking to audience members at presentations. He is the one shutting down the venues because he's still talking to folks um, because the questions they might have, the stories that they are, they want to share with him. He has such a keen appreciation for human connection. Um, I, I can't speak highly enough about Alex. And not only that, but also his his incredible intellect when it comes to memor uh, remembering um, stories and details and legislation, all that kind of thing. Um, before I dive into the episode, I am going to be doing a giveaway at the end. I'm going to be giving away one copy 
of A Guide to Discussing Assisted Suicide, written by my colleagues Jonathan Van Maren and Blaise Elaine. And so more information on that at the end of the episode. I am also giving away a copy of Love Unleashes Life, because I think that it relates to today's episode as well, by Stephanie Gray Connors. Two books that I highly, highly recommend. Stick around to the end of the episode to learn how... Um, With a a very little effort on your end, you could win uh, one of those two books. So stick around. All right, folks. Alex Schattenberg, how are you doing, sir? Thanks for joining the show. I'm doing very well, sir. It's uh, it's, uh, a beautiful day where I am. So uh, hopefully it's a beautiful day where you are. And we're going to be talking about uh, a sad topic because we're talking about death. But I think it's important to have this discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I I must admit it. It is kind of that time of year as well. As we're getting into autumn, I feel like this is a, a good time of year for reflection. I, I don't know if you're a, a Stuart McLean Vinyl Cafe kind of guy, but it always makes me think of of Morley and kind of the the autumn vibes and kind of a, a time to reflect, time to ponder on the rest of the year. Um, and so I, I think this is a really cool episode because you and I are going to dive into a lot of reflection not only on what we've Mm -hmm. been up to but also reflecting on people people in general the importance of human connection all that kind of stuff um but before we dive into that first of all i'm a little bit surprised i'm not catching you in an airport i feel like you are without a (laughs) doubt the the best traveled person and and i don't even know if you consider travel itself an objectively good thing anymore i feel like the the allure has probably worn off a little well it used to be exciting at one point (laughs) now (laughs) now with all the delayed flights constantly it's really becoming a headache but nonetheless yes i I do an awful lot of travel and a lot of presentations so yeah awful lot of travel we're going to talk about that at the end and how people can get plugged in with supporting you and the travel that you do through the euthanasia prevention coalition um but also i kind of want to set the set the foundation we've never actually done an episode either focused on the topic of euthanasia and assisted suicide or even on people who are are very actively involved mm-hmm. and i know that that's more than more than mm-hmm. every uh, sorry not not everything that you do that you do more than just talking about euthanasia and assisted suicide even though you are arguably the global authority on on this topic and i was wondering if you could give us a bit of a background as to how you got involved in life issues in general and streaming from there how you've taken on such a such a heavy role and such an important role within um, the culture of death as it pertains to addressing euthanasia and assisted suicide. Well, I've been doing this work a long time, Cam. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, literally a lifetime. I, uh, I've been doing this work full time since 1999. And uh, I got involved in the issue of euthanasia specifically, uh, basically out of two reasons. The first was um, while that whole Latimer debate was going on and you had Sue Rodriguez in Canada Sue Rodriguez uh, died in 1993, but or 1994 maybe, but she went to the Supreme Court of Canada and it was, her case was heard in 93 and the Supreme Court decided that she did not have a right to euthanasia or assisted suicide. She had ALS and she was seeking a change in the law and went through the courts to try and accomplish that. But then there was the case of Robert Latimer who killed his daughter Tracy. Uh, he uh, gassed his daughter in the cab of his truck. She had cerebral palsy. And uh, then, uh, you know, uh, it, all of this issue really got to me. And I was doing a lot of writing about it. Like, for instance, um, you know, under this theme of Carrie not killing, I produced a video. I was, I was the one doing a lot of talking about it. So, therefore, I started becoming considered an expert in it and things like that. One of the reasons I got involved in the topic was, uh, first of all, because we have a disabled son. And, well, he has autism. And we were getting involved in the disability community. And I really understood then firsthand the concept of people with disabilities experiencing a different life reality, that they are treated differently, they they are seen differently in the culture, that their life is truly, uh, their life health is truly uh, treated differently than an able-bodied person such as myself. So, you know, I could see it firsthand. And then also during that second Robert Latimer trial, we're not going to go into the history of it, but anyway, there was some polling done and it showed that 37% of Canadians thought that what Robert Latimer did was just fine. He was just a, a loving farmer who really, you know, he had no choice. He had to kill his daughter, which is, of course, what he was arguing. And I just thought that was just, you know, you, you, can, have a, you can have sympathy and, and emotions for a family caring for a, a child with cerebral palsy. But uh, the concept that it, it's a loving act to kill her that that was beyond me and so that certainly uh, got me rolling with this and we started this officially in 1998 and i started working at it full time in 1999 there was a few of us on the board we had dr deveber who was a pediatric oncologist who recently passed away and we had uh, gene Eklund, who was um you know a nurse uh, practitioner in palliative care 
who would always talk about the fact that she had been at the bed of well over a thousand people caring for them as they were dying. And, and never once did uh, anybody feel the need to ask her to have their life ended because uh, she knew how to care for them. So the fact of it is, is uh, I've been doing this for a very long time. And um, one of the reasons was uh, because of uh, experience. The second reason was simply out of necessity. Once you start doing it and people start calling on you before you know it, um, you sort of, I would say read yourself or became sort of an expert on it and you continue to go. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and also just filling the void, right? That, that there's so much that needs to happen, especially since 2015, when this really came to light for a lot of people for the first time, it feels like, yeah. I remember yeah. I, I listened to, to talks that you had given in Lethbridge and other places well before that, and that, that you were kind of trying to wake people up to the fact that this is coming down the tube. And, and obviously 2015 was a, a major year in the development yeah. in Canada, and, and this continues to go. Um, what do you... And, and this is going to be a kind of a two-part question because I'm, I would anticipate that there's kind of two elements to this answer. The mission of Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. I, I wonder if you would characterize it as twofold, not only in kind of mass engagement of people and educating them in general around euthanasia, but also particular engagement with individuals. Yeah. I don't know if that's quite how you would characterize it, but how would you kind of characterize the mission of Euthanasia Prevention Coalition? Well, it's multiplex because we don't just deal with the education. That's, I do a lot of writing and yeah. so, you know, uh, publishing articles on a constant level. I've now published, uh, I don't know, I just looked at it the other day. It was over 5,200 articles. The blog that, uh, that uh, I maintain, uh, last month alone, we had 155,000 uh, downloads on it. So it's quite substantial. And, um, and so, you know, you, you, you have done all this. But the fact of it is also we're involved politically. Uh, previous to legalizing uh, euthanasia, there was the uh, bill by Francine Lalonde that came out. There was, she actually had two bills, but the one in 2009 actually went to a vote in 2010, and it was defeated by 228 to 59. So, you know, that euthanasia bill at that time, as wide and as terrible as it was, and uh, how poorly worded as it was, etc. Well, sadly, the reality was it was actually tighter than what we have in our current laws today. You know, and if you think about that, um, you know, parliamentarians, uh, when I talked to them about the bill at that time, um, they uh, they were aghast that, oh, wow, that this this is not a good idea. So, you know, uh, by far the majority of the Liberals, uh, some uh, quite a few NDP voted against it. All the Conservatives voted against it except for one. And it was overwhelmingly defeated. And obviously that the success of defeating uh, the Francine Lalonde bill in 2010 led to the Supreme Court of Canada because what happened is the euthanasia lobby decided at that point it doesn't appear like we're going to get Parliament to pass this. So, therefore, we'll go through the courts. And that's exactly what they did. And, uh, and of course, the rest is history, isn't it? Once the court made a bad decision, and then, of course, Parliament had to uh, legislate. Uh, the Liberals came in just in time to legislate on this. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we now have the most, uh, the highest percentage of euthanasia deaths anywhere in the world are here in like, Quebec and, and British Columbia in particular, are higher than the Netherlands in their numbers uh, percentage-wise of euthanasia deaths. And uh, the reason it's so uh, lax and so wide is uh, how it was legislated in the first place. So, yeah. And we warned them. We made it very clear. You can't have, as much as I'm opposed to killing people, so I'm opposed to euthanasia, assisted suicide for all reasons, uh, but you can't have a law, if you're going to do this, you can't have a law that doesn't define the terminology within the law. And that's exactly what we got. We got a law that didn't define things. So right off the bat, how do you define a law if you didn't define it while you had it in legislation? Well, it gets defined by its practice. And that's exactly what happened. It expanded very fast. Um, I'll give you another example. Uh, recently, we've been going through the, uh, they, they have these, uh, the federal government publishes model uh, practice sort of guidelines for euthanasia. And if you look at it, you realize that the guidelines are actually expanding the law. Because the guidelines, uh, I'm not going to go into it completely, but if you read the guidelines, you realize that the legislation says A and B, and it's pretty wide open. Like, gosh, it's really wide open, and it's really ill-defined because it's still not defined. But the guidelines actually, funny enough, go further. So you know that it was the euthanasia lobby involved with creating these guidelines, but on top of it, it's the practice of the law that shifts when they pr pr produce these type of a guideline, when it makes it even wider and more, uh, more expansive, and that's what we're going through on a constant basis. Yeah. And when we talk about stories about euthanasia in Canada, we might get into that next, but I don't know. I can't make this stuff up, Cam. This is the crazy thing. If I were to write a, a book and have all these potential stories in there, they would have said, oh, 
Alex, you're just extreme. Like, like what's up with you? Like, that's not going to happen in Canada. What are you talking about? And yet we see the major media publishing these stories of this real stories of real people. And it's going over and over and over again. And you realize you can't make this stuff up. And, and, it, and yet it's that's not, what's happening. It, exactly. And it's not um, war, warmongering or anything like that. That, that no. I remember the last talk that I, I heard you give at the March for Life in, in Edmonton here a couple months ago. Um, and, and you were sharing your PowerPoint. And these were stories that were covered by all of the major news that's carriers. Right. This, this wasn't some obscure blog that hadn't been um, fact-checked by anyone before. This is CBC. This is Global. This is CTV. Things like that. I'm just and quoting were, them. I'm just exactly. quoting them. Exactly. It doesn't and, make me happy, but no, you know that's how how it is. Yeah. And and sharing that perspective, sharing the reality of what is going on, is so vital. And and that's one of the real. So what when I think of Alex Shatberg as as the the leader that you are, and and I apologize if this uh, sells you short in any way. I, I think of I am so impressed not only by your memory, the presentations that I've heard you give, and and share statistics and facts and everything from all sorts of countries around the world and all sorts of details, but also the stories and the time that you give. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I've ever been to a presentation where you left before the last person had left, unless you're running to catch a flight. The, the amount of time that you spend not only talking to members of the audience, but even more importantly, the stories that you share of interactions that you had had with people who had called in to the helpline, yeah. who had um, come across your um, your desk, your phone line, whatever it may be. Maybe before we get into those, if, if you wouldn't mind kind of greasing the wheels of story time, uh, and, and I know that these aren't kind of the, the stories to put anyone to sleep because they are such sad and tragic stories so often. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind sharing, just to put into mind the urgency of this issue for those listening, many of whom are in Canada, but also those around the world, what are we facing kind of anecdotally in Canada? This isn't just kind of a blanket. These are all... Mm -hmm the exact same kind of people that absolutely need euthanasia assisted suicide. What are we dealing with? And then we'll kind of get into the meat and potatoes of the episode of talking about the value of human connection. So I should actually give you a context in the law because then it would make more sense. So the law, when we passed it in 2016, uh, it had uh, a lot of um, problems with it. One of the things is it says it wasn't defined. So, But the original law said that it had a, a type of a terminal illness requirement in it. It said that your natural death had to be reasonably foreseeable, but it wasn't defined. And, you know, when I was reading uh, articles from the euthanasia lobby, they would say the same thing. We have no idea what this means. You'd see this in their own comments, because I would always say, I've, I don't have any understanding of what natural death is reasonably foreseeable, what that actually means. But what that meant is that because it wasn't clearly defined in any way, shape or form, therefore, you know, one physician who might be, how would you say, less or so into euthanasia might see it as a last resort. They might say to someone, well, you don't qualify under this law and somebody else, uh, like Ellen Weeb in BC, who's done a, a huge number of euthanasia deaths, uh, she might see that as, oh, well, you, your natural death is reasonably foreseeable. You, you qualify. So we had this situation where we didn't really have a terminal illness uh, requirement in the law anyway. Nonetheless, um, this, is, this was dropped after the court case in 2019. And in 2021, we passed Bill C-7, which we took out that in it. So there was no natural death is reasonably foreseeable in law anymore. What that meant is that what was left in the law was you had to have an irremediable medical condition. Now, I know you have to be 18. It says you have to be suffering. But, you know, Cam, you can't judge suffering. You can't say that that's uh, something I can, I can gauge or I can make sense of because the fact of it is, is if you tell me you're suffering, I can't tell you you're not suffering. I'm not inside your body. I don't know. So, therefore, you know what I'm saying? The only thing that they actually have, which is clear, is you have to be 18 years old and you have to have an irremediable medical condition. So what is an irremediable medical condition? Usually it means you have some sort of chronic condition, a disability, that sort of thing. So in the disability uh, movement, we're saying this law specifically gears in on us. They were right. Th that's exactly what the law did. Uh, so all of these abuses we're seeing today, or not abuses, but uh, these stories, they're coming mainly from the disability community. And the reason was, is very clear. These people... Uh, let's say somebody has a uh, significant uh, issue, uh, could be some uh, issue with their back where they can't work. So they're on disability. They're, they are, they're in a fair amount of chronic pain or chronic, they have chronic issues that are serious, right? They're not asking for euthanasia often because of their chronic situation. What they're asking for, for often is because of fear of homelessness, 
Uh, poverty, poverty is a common reason because, of course, a lot of these people are living in poverty. Uh, they might be having difficulty receiving medical treatment. Look at our medical system the way it is today. So many people have a long waiting list. But if you have a disability also, you have another secondary problem. No matter what we do to treat you, you're not getting better because your disability is what you actually have as a reality. Therefore, treatment is to ameliorate your, your pain and symptoms. But we now they might have another condition related to it that is treatable, right? You know what I'm saying? But this is the reality. So, you know, a lot of doctors don't like people with disabilities because they can't just do what they're trained to do, which is treat you, you get better, you're fine, now you don't see anymore. These people are constantly needing help. Well, the fact of it is, is a lot of people have difficult sort of conditions that uh, there isn't a lot of uh, experts out there in their condition, and they're having a hard time receiving medical treatment. So they're saying, you know, there's one, uh, there's one specialist in Toronto, and it's going to take me uh, 12 months to get in to see that specialist, but I can have euthanasia in 90 days. Now, let me explain this 90-day thing. So when we passed Bill C-7, we got rid of the terminal illness thing, that your natural death had to be reasonably foreseeable. It's nothing personal, Cam. I think your natural death is reasonably foreseeable. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, I shouldn't laugh, but that's the reality, eh? how the terminology didn't make sense. Well, what they did is they said, if you are terminally ill, so if your natural death is reasonably foreseeable, you would have no waiting period. You could have a same day death. You could go to your doctor in the morning. You could be approved for euthanasia. That doctor could get a second doctor to sign off and you could die that evening. You could have a same day death. But if you're not terminally ill, meaning you have a chronic condition and they say that you qualify, you would have to have a 90 day waiting period. So the point of this person with a disability is they're saying, I might, it might take me 12 months to get in to see a doctor for treatment, but I can have death in 90 days. And a lot of them are, this, this is the kind of pressure that's coming into the system. Uh, and it's all happened because, of course, the fact is that the law is so loosey-goosey how it's designed. And, uh, and uh, people are also human beings going through a difficult time in their life, and they're being faced with these situations. Now, just so you know, my, my experience is very clear. I got a call from this guy in... Um, British Columbia, and he also had uh, multiple disabilities. He called the helpline. We were talking to him. I was talking to him. I was the one communicating with him, and he wanted euthanasia. So I think what happened is, is that somebody said, well, you know, you, you should call this number here and talk to them because before you go ahead and have your life ended, maybe it's good to talk to them. So when I was talking to this guy, he called me, and, uh, you know, my heart went out to him because he had some significant health issues. There was no question about it. In fact, I was thinking that he probably wasn't properly treated because it didn't, it didn't totally make sense to me what he was saying. And I wasn't judging what he was saying to me as being accurate. It didn't make sense why he was experiencing these things. I thought he was not properly cared for. But nonetheless, I asked him after listening to him for quite a while, you know, listening to him, being attentive, making sure that he had my time. I asked him, but why do you actually want someone to kill you? Because that's what you're actually asking for. And he wasn't silent. He said, it's because I have nobody in my life. And I really see no purpose or meaning to continue. So you would say, well, here's a guy who must be in a lot of pain and suffering. And pain and suffering is his reason. But when I actually ask him the key question, what is he saying? Because well, there's nobody in my life. And I feel I've got no meaning or purpose to continue. And this is what it comes down to as a human person for most of these people. I had a woman call me. She called about two years ago, and it was uh, it was around January, February-ish. She had multiple health issues, and uh, she called, and she was thinking of euthanasia, but someone had obviously gave her the helpline, so she called, and I was talking to her, and I did a lot of listening because, obviously, this is a woman who had some, some difficulties, and we talked, and we talked, and I said, you know, you know, spring is coming soon, and I know how you're feeling. You're feeling down. You're feeling emotionally having – you have some health, serious health problems. I know – I can hear it that you're going through a lot of difficulty, but spring is coming soon and you might be feeling a little bit better in the spring when there's more sunshine and you might get a chance to get out of your apartment. You might get a chance to you know, use your walker and go out, get some fresh air. I can see how that's really difficult. You're stuck in your apartment. I understand completely how you're feeling, like uh, that this is terrible for you. And I hear you saying this to me. And she's saying, yes, yes. I said, I said, and then just call me back, call me back. She called me back and she called me back and she called me back. I spoke to her at least five times. Most of the time, listen, because, you know, obviously she's the one wanting to talk. And she calls me up this spring. She says, Alex, do you, do you remember me? And I said, uh, yeah, of course I do. You know, I've spoke to you quite often. Yeah, she said, well, there's a woman on our floor in my apartment building who's been approved for maid. 
and I want to talk to her to try and convince her not to do it. What should I say to her? This is the same woman originally called saying she wanted to die. And now, a couple years later, she's saying, how do I help this other woman in the building convince her to, uh, to give life a greater chance to continue living? So you can see how the whole thing comes around and the reality of the human person when you're dealing with these questions. Uh, do we always have that kind of success? I wish we did, but no. I wish we did, though. It would be very nice. But, you know, here we, we understand the reality here, especially when you hear these stories of homelessness. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Homelessness and, and like I said, isolation, because I'm sure that's something that you hear quite yeah. often, right? I mean, it, it's something that, that we get quite often while we're talking to people about abortion on street corners. We have people that come by that just want to talk. They yeah. just want to share their story. They want to share about their day. They want to talk about anything. And so often, uh, I mean, I guess even more so when we're door knocking, we find that there's people who haven't interacted with another human being for days, weeks, sometimes days, even longer weeks. than that. Yeah. And and data shows that's exactly the case. The data shows that's exactly the case. And we're not even aware that the data shows in the UK, they did a big study in the UK, one third of the seniors who live alone, that is one third of them who live alone, said that they had not talked to more than one or two people in a week. So, you know, that's a lot of loneliness. Uh, and they said also, if someone just says to them in a line at the bank or at the grocery store, how was your day? That would just make them so happy. So obviously you come into someone's door, they're saying to you, oh, come on in, dear, let's have some tea. <laughs> and it's a reality because they're lonely and they're thinking, someone's coming to my door. This person doesn't look so cruel or anything. <laughs> so it looks pretty safe to me. <laughs> come on in, let's do tea. And, uh, you know, you're actually making their day because... Uh, they're very lonely and we have a culture of loneliness and it's a serious problem in our culture it's a serious problem and i talk about this as a culture that's how would you say ready for killing it's a culture of abandonment it's a culture of uh you know there's so many people there's so many people who uh, who are getting older who have had a family they have nobody around them anymore they might be a widow widower they might have been divorced or whatever the case might be uh they're alone and they're lonely and let's say they come up with a, with a serious health condition. You could see how the concept of euthanasia starts looking good because you're thinking, what is my reason? What is my purpose? What is my meaning? These are the questions they're actually asking. And we're, uh, you know, floating in front of them the concept of death. And then we're wondering why it's become so popular so fast. It's because the culture is in need of a lot of caring people. Yeah. Absolutely. And and like you said, we're, we are ripe for death right now because I, I feel like for decades now, we have been preaching the secular virtue of independence as though it were the religious virtue of fortitude that somehow strength and perseverance can only be characterized as such if you're doing it by yourself and there's nobody nobody helping or contributing that you are the helper one and that nobody's supporting you and then we have these people that are getting to the, the age where they're no longer able to live yeah. or work or contribute with the same degree of independence or even being the ones on whom others are dependent rather yeah. than vice versa and now we're in this identity crisis where i've always been the helper one I don't want to be the one who's receiving the help. I want to be the one who's giving the help at, at the very most, if not just leave me alone and let me um, on my, my own um, kind of day-to-day -day happening. And then they realize just how isolating that is as soon as they retire, as soon as their, their kids move out or whatever it may be, the isolation sets in and they realize that independence isn't the, um, the be-all, end-all that we've been trying to build it up, I, I feel like, as a culture. Do you kind of see it the same way or what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's exactly what's going on. We have a radical nature in our culture right now that's undermining what it is, it, what it means to be human. So, what do I mean by that? It sounds like a pretty, you know, philosophical concept, and actually, it's not. I deal with everything from what I would call the lived experience of a human person. So, whether you call it the nature of the human person or the reality of what it means to be human, the concept of euthanasia, assisted suicide, or modern concept of individualism actually undermines what it means to be human. Because what we're actually doing is we're saying that I can do everything on my own. We sell euthanasia as freedom, choice, autonomy. Well, Cam, we all want freedom. We all want choice and we all want autonomy. But first of all, I'm going to get to the philosophical thing, get that out of the way. It's a lie. Why is it a lie? Euthanasia is never about freedom. It's never about choice and it's never about autonomy. It is about the doctor having the right and law to kill you. That's what it is. Just read the legislation. You know, you tell me... Uh, 
oh, Alex, that's, no, read the legislation. That's what it's about. They're going to sell it as freedom, choice, and autonomy because that's what the culture wants. They're going to wave the flag that everyone wants to see. The reality is we've given doctors the right in law to kill you. I'm going to go one step further to prove to you that I'm not even kidding with you. The law says, so the law goes through the the things the doctor must do to approve your death. Then the, then it says in the, in the legislation, the doctor must be of the opinion you fit the criteria of the law. So here's my point. Anytime we've had some of these crazy stories like the Alan Nichols death and, and um, you know, these different, like, like, there's a whole pile of them. Um, Donna Duncan is another one and things like that. You'd say, how could that person have been killed by euthanasia? How did that decision get made? How could that be? It doesn't matter because the law says the doctor only had to be of the opinion you fit the criteria of the law. What it meant is that the doctor's got full legal coverage for killing you. And you're supposed to feel good about that. And this is about freedom, choice, and autonomy. It's not. It's about abandonment. It's about killing people at their time of need. And it's about giving these doctors and nurse practitioners the complete freedom and the right in law to do so. And there's no way you can charge them. Even if what they did seemed ridiculous. And you'd want to come back to me and say, oh, as long as they filled out the forms and it's signed by two applicable people and they were of the opinion you fit the criteria of the law. The Alan Nichols case really comes together because the the family was shocked when he died by euthanasia. They just couldn't believe it. So they asked for an investigation. And I, and I was talking to the family from the very beginning. And I said to them, that's a very good idea. You should ask for an investigation. You should get an investigation done. But I said, I'll tell you, they're going to find that nothing was done outside of the law. And they said, how could that be, Alex? I said, just read the law. The law says that the doctor had to be of the opinion that uh, Alan fit the criteria of the law. And obviously the doctor was of the opinion that Alan fit the criteria of the law. His opinion is, is a wide thing. And we all have opinions. I might agree with your opinion or you might not agree with mine, but nonetheless, it's an opinion, right? So let's get down to it. The culture is, is, uh, is seriously in trouble because we have this serious amount of loneliness, but we also have this radical concept of individualism that doesn't actually fit the reality of what it means to be human. So we sell individualism and say that I can do what I want. You know, my wife loves to move around the furniture cam. And several times I've stubbed my toe because I come home. And maybe I was gone for the day and she moved around some of the furniture. I didn't know there was a chair there. <laughs> and I stubbed my toe in the morning or whatever it was. And I always say, you know, if you want to move around the furniture, that's fine. No problem. But when you ask me to be involved in it, then it's not about your decision anymore. It's also about my decision, whether I want that furniture to be moved. So now in the case of euthanasia, we're killing people and we're saying it's all about your freedom. Well, no, the doctor's lethally injecting you. How did that become about your freedom? Like, honestly, the doctor's agreeing that your life isn't worth living and lethally injecting you. That's not about autonomy. You might have asked for it, but there's many reasons you might ask for it. There's many reasons you might be down in your life, so down that you feel that life... Um, and its meaning is very difficult to assess at that point. But that's not new. This is nothing new about it. It's always been part of the human reality that there are people who feel suicidal or feel that their life is lacking of meaning. And sadly, there's always been people who have ended their lives. That's not new. I'm not saying there's anything good about it. I'm just saying it's not new. The difference now is that we're killing them. Yeah. And and that that's not even to to open the can of the quote unquote encouragement and and quote unquote support that medical pre uh, professionals are often lending them to steer them in that direction as well i mean not even to get into a whole conversation about the finite resources of our medical system and whatnot and and how there's an economic reason for doctors and yeah. nurses to be pushing yeah. people in that direction but also it, it breaks my heart when I, I mean, I, I talk to um, emergency room doctors on street corners and they talk about like, oh yeah, we had somebody come in um, and we found out they were a month pregnant. We didn't even tell them. We just gave them drugs that we knew would kill their child because this is a street woman. She's been in 10 times already. She's addicted to all kinds of different things. And we, we just couldn't bear having her come in and having her kid come in, all that kind of stuff. And, and these quote unquote executive decisions coming from medical professionals and and uh, obviously you see that and and hear of that all the time of, of medical yeah. professionals who are pushing their patients um, in the direction of medical aid and dying, um, and and not even necessarily because they're malicious, hateful people that want to kill people, but because they're misguided and because they haven't had the opportunity to come face to face and really 
challenge the question. I, I pulled the book off my shelf of Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor yeah. Frankl. Yeah. And, and that question of, of there aren't enough people that understand that equation of despair is so often suffering without meaning, as we touched on at the beginning, and how what that person needs is not euthanasia-assisted suicide, but rather friends and time yeah. and exactly care it. kind of thing. When we get a call, let's, you know, obviously you're doing a lot of listening. Calls. Anyway, but the fact of it is, is that, uh, the fact of it is, is that uh, most often someone needs to talk to somebody. And, you know, I'll often say to them, do you have a friend? Do you have family members? Is there somebody in your life? Uh, is there somebody who you've known in the past who you could contact today and talk to who, uh, who values and who'd be happy to talk to you? You know, because I'll give you, uh, you know, even a better example. This, uh, this Tyler, last January, Tyler was in uh, the media because he wanted to die by euthanasia and he was homeless. He had been homeless for about eight years. Uh, not completely consecutive. Like he had some periods of time within that eight years where he had a home, but not for very long. And, and he's got a lot of, you know, mental health concerns and issues like that. And which would be natural in the case of someone who's been homeless for so long. And it's sort of uh, skidding along and, and his life has been very difficult. Very, very, very difficult. He's got a lot of horrific stories of things he's experienced, but he wanted to die by euthanasia. And of course, he, he went to the media because that that time the government was talking about delaying euthanasia for mental illness until March of 2024, which is now the case, right? The government passed that legislation to delay euthanasia for mental illness until March of 2024. The crazy thing is we're still going to have euthanasia for mental illness officially begin in March of 2024. Like, um, uh, we can go into that in a minute. But anyway, so Tyler was obviously not wanting that to be delayed because he wanted euthanasia. One of our supporters helped Tyler. Now, first of all, I had lunch with Tyler. I contacted Tyler, the guy who wrote the article. I had lunch with Tyler, and he was pretty belligerent to me because, you know, he was thinking there should be a right to euthanasia and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, we had a discussion, and, and he was very interesting. It was worth having that discussion. It was, a, it was, a, it was good because he went to the media. So, obviously speaking, he's, he's, he's someone who's worth talking to. But one of our supporters actually helped Tyler and took him in and gave him a place to live, and it's helped him for quite a while. And uh, Tyler doesn't want to die anymore. Right, because there's someone who actually cares about him. There's someone who's uh, who's uh, in his corner. There's someone who's helped him find some meaning for work, and uh, he, now with meaning and purpose, his life he wants to live. He uh, and he thinks it's a crazy idea because he was at a low time. He was at a super low time. If they had approved his death, if it, if it was possible at that point to approve his death, and they had done so, it wouldn't have been about freedom and choice and autonomy. It would have been abandoning a guy who's in deep need of of help of cultural help, social help, personal help, uh, and he would have been dead. Dead people don't get help. They're gone. You see, that's how it goes. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that we're talking about all, all, all over again. Now, the thing about Viktor Frankl is very important because he's identifying exactly the same reality as we're seeing in the culture today. And, and it very much concerns me that we have so much, so much abandonment within the culture. And a lot of people question and they say, oh, Alex, it's not so bad. Well, you know, actually, I live in a small town. And in a small town, you know, people seem to be more interconnected. I think the reason is because there isn't a lot of people in the town. You get to meet them at the grocery store. You bump into them here and there and everywhere. You know, if there's there's a couple of people in, in our little town. They clearly have uh, some mental health issues. But they have a place to live. They have an apartment. You, you see them around. You know who they are. There's no issues. Like, they just they're just part of the town. That's how it is. And it's all fine and good. But you can see how you get lost if you're in, uh, in a cultural situation where there's nobody who recognizes you or cares about you or shows any time for you you could see how maybe death starts seemingly looking like a good idea yeah yeah absolutely and and, and let's dive into that further and, and that can kind of be the the crescendo for this episode no. um crescendo of, is a good movie <laughs> um of how people can can make real difference by their their yeah. interactions kind of thing. And and this isn't to say that lobbying or petitions or whatever are not important. We can do an episode on that as well. But I I feel like so often when I'm going door to door, when I'm talking to people on street corners, I feel like I am shifting more and more in my conversation about like, yes, you know what, legislation is important. Yes, funneling resource towards pregnancy care centers is important. 
but you need to be a good friend, a good neighbor, a good coworker, yes. good family member to the people around you. Because so often the people that I talk to who are post-abortive, all they needed was for somebody to be able to babysit their, their four-year-old so they could go to the prenatal um, appointments. All they needed was somebody to be able to help out with meals on Friday night or pick the kids up from, from daycare or something like that. Little things, all things considered that would have led them to not having an abortion. And and from what you've been sharing as well, of how often that is the case for, for people who are contemplating assisted suicide and euthanasia, that, that it's often relatively small things, sometimes very large things, um, not to sell it short. But I wonder what kind of words of encouragement do you often give, whether to audiences in the talks that you're giving, or even just one-on-one as you're talking to friends and family, as to how they can be culture warriors that don't necessarily need a platform. You don't need to necessarily run for office per se, but rather be a better neighbor, I suppose. Well, it's twofold. First of all, we can change the world one person at a time. I might be, I not, might not have the ability to change the world in general. And if I, and we all know people, we all have family members, we all have friends, we all know people in our communities around us. And you know that someone's going through a difficult time. Um, you know, visiting someone and being with someone, traveling with them through their difficult times is essential. Could you imagine if you're going through a um, significant health condition and you're all alone? You know, I have a friend who's right now going through cancer treatment. He's doing 30 days in a row of this. And uh, every day he's sending out texts and every day I'm responding. And I've said, you know, you know, we, should have, we have to have lunch together and things like that. But I'm always responding and sending little messages. Why? Because I know... It's a heck of a thing that he's going through. And if he's going to go through it alone, that'd be too tough. Now, he's also got a granddaughter that he loves dearly. And that makes all the difference in his life. But you see, it's that, once again, that interconnectedness. But you have a neighbor. You have a friend. You have people you know. Like, uh, I always use the story of the uh, when we first moved to our little town, there was a woman across the street who was in her early 90s. And, and at that time, my, uh, my, uh, my youngest daughter was fairly young. And she said, you know, can I go across the street and visit Mrs. So-and-so? We'd say, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I, I better talk to Mrs. So-and-so first. Okay. No problem. I went over to talk to Mrs. So-and-so. She said, oh, I'd love to have her over. I'd love to. Have... So everything was fine. It was just right across the street. There was never an issue. This was a woman who was a retired teacher. She just enjoyed it so much. It was wonderful. But then my, uh, my youngest son, who was, you know, at the time, I think he was like four or something. Can I go and visit Mrs. Holmes across the street? We're like, ooh, we better talk to her about that first. You know, I think so. <laughs> anyway, uh, but you know, when it comes together, here's the thing: when she died, we we went to the to the funeral home, and we brought our two youngest kids with us because they were the ones visiting her all the time. We went to the funeral home, and what did all the family say? Oh, this is so and so and so. Oh, our mother talked about you all of the time, all of the time. You were so important to her. Now, I'm not saying this was a woman who absolutely needed my kids to visit, uh, and I'm not suggesting that you should go do that, send your kids across the street to the elderly neighbor, but I mean, you know, I'm getting to. It was so important to her, and all we were doing is saying, well, for some reason, our kids like going to go vi- like visiting her, and she seems to be okay with it. This is good with us because uh, no, no issues are happening, so this is good, and that's exactly what happened. But, you know, we have people in our communities that are no one talks to. But, you know, I'm going to go with the next step. What about your faith communities? Our faith communities, historically in the past, it was normal that within a faith community that if you knew Mrs. So-and-so was having health issues or having difficulties, that someone would go visit and help. Or people in the community would just do that. It was part of the normal understanding of living within a community. And they just did it. My mother did it all the time. My mother's always done this. Now she's uh, 82 and she's getting a little bit old to get out, you know, so it's getting harder on her, but she... She doesn't really do that as much now, but for 50 years, she always did this. This is the experience I had. My mother always visiting people, uh, going to the hospital, going to their houses, visiting them, talking to them, and it was normal, but now it's become the exception. I'm not saying it's not being done anywhere. I'm just saying in reality, people of faith are also dying by euthanasia. And you would say, Cam would say, well, wait a second, Alex, doesn't uh, the faith community recognize the sad reality that this is murder? which is true, it is. That's what doctors are doing. They're killing people. Now, you might have asked for it, but it doesn't matter. It's actually, a, it's a killing. That's you can Call it what you want. You can call it made all you want. It's, what it is, is killing. And yet, people in the faith community are saying, um, maybe that's what I'm going to do. And that's how some of them are dying. And it has a lot to do with the fact that we've also changed in the culture. So if you are part of a faith community, are you actually so different 
than the regular community or are you just a little bit different? And I recognize what's happened in, the, in this uh, secular, humanist, uh, radical, individual culture. It's, it's invaded all of us. It's made all of us change, even though we may not realize it ourselves. We are different beings and we have to go back to going and visiting and being with and recognizing that we're part of an interconnected community that's essential to the human person. You don't have to be a person of faith to recognize it either, because that's how you are. Uh, you want to thrive in, in the world. You want to be happy. Uh, happiness comes through our interconnectedness, what we do with others, how we live our lives. You know, our families are so important to us, but our friends are too. They are what make us a whole being, uh, whether we are in a faith community or not. But I mean, I, the faith community should be challenged in this, say, well, are you actually doing this? So we have a training program that we offer through the Compassionate Community Care Charity that we work with. They uh, they offer a visiting training program, uh, and they uh, they offer training regularly, and I'm often part of that training program. And it's very important because it trains people to go visit. Uh, the art of visiting has been lost. Uh, but on top of it, there's one other point with the uh, whole situation. When you do visiting, you need to uh, also make sure that uh, you understand the nature of one's privacy and all these other issues because we don't infringe upon anybody. We're here to care for people and help people. We're not here to uh, cause difficulties in the world and have people worry that you know, someone's taking advantage of my mom or something. You know. Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. And, and the importance of, I, I mean, I'm sure there's a, a perseverance component to that as well. I feel like there's some people who will say like, oh, well, I, I never went back to visit them or I, I don't know if I would hit it off or I, I'm, I'm a bit of a introvert these kinds of things. And I feel like there's something to be said for um, accepting the challenge, right? That, that I, the, the visits, the conversations that you have, you don't necessarily, I mean, you're a very, in my experience, outgoing person, you like having conversations, you like talking with folks, but I'm sure that there's at least sometimes that you say like, oh, I didn't quite hit it off with that person. It didn't feel as natural as talking yeah. to my best friend kind of thing. And yet, it, I mean, friendships take time and investment takes time. And, and sometimes people are initially very off-putting on purpose. I, I've had a number of friends who are very yeah. off-putting on purpose because they want to know how much you actually want to be with them, how much you actually want to be friends with them, how much you actually care about them. And if they can throw you off by saying, uh, a poor flavored joke or or not laughing at your joke or something like that and, and turn you off and just like end it right there. Well, then they've, they've done their litmus test on like, this person doesn't actually care about me. This person isn't interested. This person is, is scared away easily. This person is going to abandon me like everyone else. I, I wonder if that's something that you've experienced kind of in your ministry, but also if you have any kind of wisdom for people that might have a hard time reconnecting with their grandmother who's in, um, who's in palliative care, who's a very grouchy, cranky kind of person, or this person that they, they tried to go for coffee with, but it was just really awkward word kind of thing. So, <laughs> what words of wisdom so Cam, we always tell people that it's it's not about you yeah that the reason you're doing this visiting is you're recognizing that there is somebody who needs a visitor there they, they need somebody in their life uh, whether it's been identified by a friend or you've identified that yourself if someone's at a nursing home for instance you would say well there's lots of people in the nursing home they I'm not really lonely like it's all these there's staff there's this is that and yet for some people in a nursing home is the loneliest place they can be and yet for others, of course, they are really social types. And for some reason, I love this nursing home. And this is a great place for them. <laughs> Maybe the people around them don't love that they love the nursing home so much, but you know what I'm getting to. Uh, but the other thing is the art of listening. Uh, when we do our training sessions on visiting, we always say, you know, for some people, they don't want you to talk. Just being there is more than enough. And they want to talk or they sometimes the silence is OK because there's a body in the room. Someone there saying it's, it's fine. It's fine. You don't want to talk. That's okay. Uh, that's fine with me. I'm okay with that. But uh, I'm here if you want to. I know the other thing is we also do the one other thing. We train people to talk to people about their life. You know, if you ask somebody about their life, it really changes the perception of themselves. And it's very important because I, so if I say, Cam, tell me about your children, da, 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 you know, and you tell me all about your children and everything. Obviously speaking, you're affirmed by that because I actually showed interest in your children. So if I say, tell me about your life, what, what was your younger life like? T tell me about, um, you know, you were married. How many kids did you have? Uh, you know, I'm just interested in these kind of things. I'm interested in you, not for the sake of me, but for the sake of you. I'm interested in maybe, you know, writing your story. 
you, you, you sound like you've had such an interesting life. I'm interested in your story. And guess what? That changes the perception completely because suddenly they start thinking, you know, I have had an interesting life. Some people are losing their memory. Uh, but, you know, the interesting thing about losing your memory, you tend to lose your immediate memory. Like you're having a hard time remembering what you had yesterday for, for dinner. But what happened in the 1980s, you, you remember that pretty well, actually. And whether the story is completely accurate or not, I mean, you have it down pretty much. Yeah, we did this, we did that. We, did, we always used to go camping. We, and they, they tell their stories. It's reminiscent, reminiscent therapy. And we're not trying to be psychologists or psychologists. We're not trying to be anything of the sort. We're simply trying to be friendly and care about someone. That's all we're trying to do. But with that reminiscent therapy, you really help someone feel better about themselves. But sometimes it's just listening. Yeah. You know? Sometimes it's just listening. And and I might even take that one step further and, and feel free to contradict me if if I'm off base here. But I what I've found as well is even sometimes it's just being. That yep. I my my yep. mom I, I love my mom to bits and I love my grandmother. My grandmother passed away last summer um, at a, a ripe old age, and my my mom picked up crosswords. My mom hates crosswords. My mom hates doing crosswords. But my mom started mm. doing crosswords because she knew that my grandmother loved crosswords. And so she would come, she'd come from Victoria where my, my parents live and she'd come to a Southern Alberta where my grandma was living and they would do crosswords together. And my mom would just like incessantly ask questions and, and they would like, they'd talk, they'd talk all morning, whatever, but then they'd, they'd come to a lull in a conversation and they'd just sit side by side. And my mom would be like a five letter word for this or, or like, how, how am I supposed to get? And, and it, it wasn't even like a, a super human, personal, deep diving uh, sort of discussion or anything like that. It, it was just being together. I've known people that have gone to seniors' homes, talked for five, ten minutes, and then just sat and read their book while their their friend reads their book. And and maybe a conversation sparks up 10, 15, 20 minutes later. Maybe the person falls asleep and wakes up and they're still there reading that – Sure. Having, I mean, listening is obviously ideal. If you can be in a, a more meaningful conversation, then fantastic. But I, I would pause to say that even being there, that it's not a matter of your, your coffee is over as soon as you run out of things to say. It doesn't have to be a, a quick, witty exchange constantly, but no. literally just being with somebody can go so far as well. I agree that being with is essential. It's, it's, a, it's what's important to be human. We connect even when we're silent. Now, here's the thing, though. For us who are considered sort of radical types because we're opposed to killing. I don't know how you could be a radical because you're opposed to killing, but, uh, you know, you know, I am opposed to killing people. But anyway, the fact of it is, is that, uh, and I've just confessed it. But anyway, the fact of it is, is that uh, we are fundamentally about caring for people. You know, the culture of death, their answer to human difficulty is to kill you. Um, that's no answer. We're all going to die anyway. I'm not about avoiding death. I'm not afraid of dying. But I, I don't believe it's ever acceptable for me to kill you. And I don't think that's my place, nor do I think that ever helps you or anybody else. Uh, because it actually dehumanizes the person you're doing this to. And when we talk about human equality, you see, a lot of people don't understand. We're all about human equality. I believe that you are essentially completely equal to me. And whether you are someone who is nearing death, someone with a, with a profound disability, uh, a newborn baby, it doesn't matter. We are all equal human beings. And you see, because of human equality, you are safe. You are seen as important. You are seen that your life and your person has meaning by me and by a culture. But if the culture rejects that human equality, which is where they're at today, and we can kill somebody, now it's very dangerous. And when I say to people all the time, I don't feel safe in a culture where my doctor or my nurse practitioner are the right and law to kill me. And they say, but you have to ask, Alex. And I always point out, but there's lots of reasons I might ask. There's lots of reasons I might be going through a difficult time in my life. I am a human being. I'm not a computer, right? I'm a human being. I have emotions. I have a psychological nature. I might become very depressed. I might be very lonely. I might feel going through existential distress. All these things are realities for a human being. And now I'm going through a health condition. You're saying it's my choice. No, they should be saying, how can I help you live until you die? That's the reality. Getting, so to bring this all together, think of the Alan Nichols story again. What made Alan Nichols' story different in 2019 when he died by euthanasia was not that he hadn't gone through um, suicidal ideation before. 
as his family said, he'd gone through suicidal, suicidal ideation many times. He had been in um, a psychiatric ward of a hospital on many occasions because he was so deep that they had to put him in to protect him for a period of time, and then he would feel better again and reintegrate. And he was fine. You know, he had those times where he went through. He needed times of protection. This time, when he asked for death, they took it as a request for medical aid in dying, euthanasia, and they killed him. So the difference between his previous bouts of deep, dark times where he had suicidal ideation and the time where he got killed was only the fact that in 2019, they considered that a request for euthanasia and they killed him. Both, both situa All those situations were the same. One had the outcome of killing. Uh, that's not about freedom. And you can understand in his condition that the way he was, that he was going through this on many occasions in his life, that this was not about his choice, his, his autonomy, his... No, it was about him needing help. And instead he was provided death. And these are the, this is the reality we're talking about. And they say, oh, some people are really suffering and nearing the end of their life. Well, some people are suffering. That's true. I'm not, I'm not going to argue that. But that's actually the, the tiny number. Most people, it's because they fear for their future. Most people, it's because they feel their life has no more meaning, purpose, or value. So we're going to kill people because they've lost meaning, purpose, or value. And we're already talking now, and this has been our main conversation for the last little while, but well, how do we actually care for these people? Because this is not the fundamental reality of being human. Yeah. You want to be human. You don't kill people. Humanity is about how I care for someone. That's what makes me human. Yeah. There it is, folks. And, okay. and we need to... I, we need to respond when those notes, the, the, whether it's the, the new aged suicide note, which is that appeal for medical aid in dying, or whether it's long before that, we need to be there for people. We need to be there for the people around us, as difficult as that might feel, especially starting out as awkward, as uncomfortable as that might seem, um, to put your neck out there and invite somebody for coffee or ask if you can pop over to their house or invite them over to your place or even just give them a phone call. Um, it, there's no knowing how far that can go. And maybe you're not necessarily taking talking somebody off of the ledge in that very moment, no. but maintaining those friendships and, and sense of community and support may help somebody never find their way up onto that ledge or may help them know that if ever they do find themselves on that ledge, they've got a friend like you that they can call and, and maybe they don't call you and say, hey, I'm standing on the ledge, talk me out of killing myself. But maybe while they're standing on the ledge, they give you a call and just, hey, I just wanted to see how you're doing. And it's not weird because you've already broken the ice on that kind of conversation and you are able to talk them off the ledge without ever knowing that they were on the ledge in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's a, a need that we need to deepen as pro-lifers, as Christians, as people of faith, of people maybe even without faith, that we need to get away from this secular humanist kind of independence mentality and rather embrace our human nature as an interconnected community. Absolutely. So as I say, this culture denies our human nature. Anyway, contact the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition is easy. You can, I don't know if I should use the word, but you can Google us. It comes up nice and easy, Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. It's epcc.ca. You should go to my blog. I've been writing for years. And so, uh, you know, blogs are getting old. But I mean, uh, because I have so much on the blog, it's awfully hard to convert it over. But anyway, they've got, about, as I said, about 5,200 articles on there. But it's good to follow the issue very closely. But I fundamentally said to you, uh, what is the primary nature of this issue is how do I care for someone? Because killing is never a solution to human problems. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'll, I'll throw all of those links into the show notes below. I'm looking on your website right now for events that are upcoming. And I see that you've got one on Saturday, October 21st coming up um, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, I'm sure that you've got lots of other events. Is it fair to say that if somebody were to subscribe to your email list, they would get updates on what you've got coming down the tube? Is that fair Whether to say? Whether they or like no? it or not, they'd get updates say, <laughs> at least minimally twice a week. Uh, the Grand Rapids Conference, you can either join in person or online. Okay. So that's uh, so we have the link either way. Um, so that's exactly uh, we're trying to reach out to people. And I go all over the place uh, speaking, uh, literally uh, all over the world. Um, and um, in fact, it's becoming a problem because uh, I'm starting to actually have to say no. So at times. So. And and it's cool because Alex, I, I've listened to you speak in some very small and out of the way towns that, that you're not the the ben shapiro i'm only going to a stadium that that gets packed with fifty thousand people again i i admire mm. so much your willingness to go to not only the large I presentations you've yeah, you've done your share of large presentations but you've also done your share of small Absolutely. ones because you know the need right 
So. Absolutely. We have thousands of followers. So it's important that we just continue to do and to speak and to go out and to uh, engage and, and make, uh, make a difference in people's lives. So, yeah. Bingo. Well, thanks so, so much, Alex, for taking the time to join me on the show. I'd love to get you back on here again to talk a little bit more in depth about um, some of the politics and some of the um, petition kind of things more than just um, what we focus on today. But I, I'm so glad that we started with this conversation. Thanks a ton for thank, taking the thank time. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, folks, that's my conversation with Alex Schattenberg, Executive Director, Founder of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition of Canada. Excellent man, um, excellent leader within the pro-life community and, and profound human being when it comes to how keenly he understands human nature and the need for human interaction. I, I love listening to Alex. I love talking with him. Um, I love understanding all of the lessons that he has learned through his ministry over the last 20 or so years now, um, not to mention all of the other work that he has done within the, the Canadian and global pro-life movement. Uh, a good a good guy to talk to, to know, to learn from. If he is coming to a, a venue near you, um, and the guy speaks, it feels like every day um, in a different location. That, that guy spends more time on airplanes than, than I can ever imagine. Um, if you've got an opportunity to listen to him speak, then please do connect with him. Um, not only through the presentation, listen to all the stuff that he has to say, but also consider chatting with him afterwards. Say hi on my behalf, if you could, please. Um, and and just drink in as much uh, of his wisdom as you possibly can. As I mentioned off the top of the show, I got two books that I'm giving away. One copy from my colleague, um, Jonathan Van Maren and Blaise Elena, Guide to Discussing Assisted Suicide. And the second from my, my friend and former mentor, Stephanie Gray Connors, Love Unleashes Life. What we're going to do. Literally, what you got to do to do this is you have to comment on this YouTube video. I know some of you aren't tuning in on YouTube. You're probably listening on a podcatcher somewhere. Please comment on YouTube. You get qualified if you um, comment. And so I'm going to wait until we got a couple of comments on the video. And then I'm going to do a draw for the first two people. And then I'll contact you and I'll let you um, have a choice. First person gets first pick on which book you would like. Second person gets um, whichever one is left over. No, I'll probably give you whichever book you want as well. Comment on the YouTube video. You got to be a subscriber. Okay, you don't have to be a subscriber to be able to comment, but to be able to win, you have to both be subscribed to the YouTube channel and comment on this video. Okay, again, I've said this for the last couple of episodes, YouTube is so important because it's the most visible um, platform when it comes to gauging your following. People can see that I got 605 um, subscribers, which is really, really cool, and I really appreciate it. Um, not only the more subscribers we have, the higher the algorithms boost um, on YouTube, but also the more likely it is I'll be able to get some higher profile guests coming on the show as well. We've got a bunch of really good ones coming up that I'm thrilled about. However, there's a few that I'm working on that are, are a bit of a reach for me. Um, and the following that we have here, we've, we're getting, we, we just rolled over, I think we just rolled over 140,000 downloads, which is incredible. Um, and so thank you so, so much for that. Um, but the bigger we're able to get on YouTube, the easier it'll be for me to be able to re um, request and recruit some of the higher profile guests as well. And so please do that. That's how it goes again. If you're a subscriber, if you're not a subscriber, subscribe. If you uh, Once you are a subscriber, comment on this video. Um, I will wait for, I don't know, maybe this is going to get posted on a Tuesday. I will, um, by the end of the day, Friday, everybody who has commented by the end of the day, Friday, and so you don't necessarily have to be the first one commented. Um, um, end of the day, Friday, I will put everybody who has commented into a draw. Um, two people who are drawn will get copies of these two books. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. If that is not clear, or if you're confused about that in any way, or if you have suggestions, um, questions, comments, concerns, queries, whatever they may be, um, hit me up at email at and um, email at prolifeguys.com. Um, shoot along that way. Uh, thanks a ton for tuning in and may God bless you abundantly wherever you're at, however many hours are left in your day. Yeah.